there's very little sort of global level frameworks or guidances that's that's clearly given to the corporates. And that's why we're sort of in that transition period where we need to bring that consensus and that that sort of um, understanding how to account for how to report. Until then, I feel like you can just you can just say it. Um, and, and consumers will not know. And, and I work in this field, but if I talk to my grandmother, if, if she's booking an airline ticket and the airlines is were carbon neutral, she's gonna believe it. So, so I think it, it's an effort by all parties. So corporates need to follow the, the net zero target and how to get there, sort of the, that structure. And, and consumers also need to be educated. Um, how to differentiate uh, uh, greenwashing versus non. Margaret Kim is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Margaret, or Maggie, is the CEO of the Gold Standard Foundation, whose standard Gold standard for the global goals allows climate and development interventions to quantify, certify, and maximize impacts towards the Paris Climate Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Maggie was previously the head of Green Climate Fund Liaison in the Office of Director General for the Global Green Growth Institute, GGGI where she also served as head of strategy and integration. Maggie has also held leadership roles in the private sector, including as general manager, sales strategy and business development for a leading biotechnology company. Her strengths in strategy, strategic development and resource mobilization, coupled with a passion for sustainable development and combating climate change supports gold standard in delivering on their vision for climate security and sustainable development for all. Maggie, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. Thank you, Mark, for having me. You're, you're most welcome. I'm so excited that you're here. We're gonna have a lot to talk about and, and we're gonna almost go fast and furious because we've got mm -hmm. really deep subjects and topics that we want to cover and we want to take everybody all the listeners on a journey kind of uh, get them up to speed on what's going on how how it's developed over the years um, that the, the not only the gold standard's been around but this whole carbon credits carbon offsetting how do we understand that you know uh, dispel some myths i've been fortunate and lucky enough to have past CEOs of the gold standard on the show. So matter of fact, a podcast with Marion Verlis and um, also know Adrian Rimmer. So clear back in, uh, in 2010 and before for us, who also, also served as CEO. So um, you, you're in good company. I'm in good company speaking to you. And, and uh, the, maybe I guess the first is how, how does that work for a gold standard coming in as CEO and there's past CEOs? Is this, um, uh, do you have other, other core work or things that you do at the same time? Or is it, uh, how, how does that position work? So, of course, um, I'm continuing the, the wonderful legacy the previous CEO set out for, for me and for the gold standard. And I, I came into this role at a very critical time, not only because of the global sort of movement of combating climate change and advocating for a sustainable future, but really a gold standard itself was going through a, a, a change. Um, we decided to practice the, the best governance, best practice governance by separating the standard setting, the methodology development in one hand that's led by the foundation as a nonprofit. And then the certification and verification body now is led by Marianne, the, the predece predecessor goal stand in my position, um, leading the, the company sustained cert. So, so we're creating that independence between standard setting and a certification decision, which, which qualifies us as an ICL member, which is a, is a global um, international sustainable uh, sustainability standards group. 
um, and, and to show the market that, that there's transparency, there's that independence in the offsets that, that individuals and corporates are purchasing. So, so I'm, I'm excited to join in that really great momentum. And of course, it's a critical years that we're, we're in and we are facing to address climate change, to make sure we raise ambition. So it's a lot of uh, strategic uh, strategy development and making sure we engage stakeholders to bring consensus, to scale the market, to, to scale the, the verification and certification using technology. So it's, it's really exciting to be continuing that great legacy. That's beautiful. Thanks. Thanks for that explanation. So we, we want to kind of take everyone on a journey of making sense of, of, of what's out there and how you're uh, uh, developing and, and moving forward. We've just experienced and still are experiencing the most crazy times, not just plant pandemic, Black Lives Matter uh, issues, uh, tons of issues with race, especially in, in the Asian population now in the United States with some horrific things going on that are tied kind of, or, or I don't know even where the thought goes, tied to China and, and a Asian people in general, that has to do with the pandemic, which was just, just craziness going on. Black Lives Matters. Then we had the inauguration craziness. We've got Brexit. We've got all these things going on around the, the world. You guys have all been talking about this. You've been involved in the Paris Agreement and the, and the Sustainable Development Goals in thinking around sustainability, environmental, social governance. How, as an organization, but also if you can maybe give us some insights, Maggie, on, on what you've personally experienced, some learning lessons, how have you weathered all this craziness and what things have changed, what things have you learned, or um, is there some kind of a resilient or model out there that just really works a lot better uh, for humanity? <laughs> wow, that's an overwhelming question on its own. Um, I think to me, uh, I started to reflect on this after, you know, I never thought this pandemic would last for this long. And in the last 12 months or so, we've seen, I mean, nowadays news don't really surprise me. In a sense, I feel like there, there, there has been so many critical, crazy news out there that affected everybody's life in the last couple of years and, and last couple of months. And to me, the, the global pandemic, the, the uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, recent you know, hate crimes against Asians and the elections, all of that really further unravel the complexity of systems and its associated risks around climate change. And, and the I personally believe climate change is the biggest threat and risk that human race has ever faced. And, and there are numerous levels of interdependency, interconnectedness, and nonlinear interactions in all of this, the systems that we live in, and the society that we live in. And that really got me thinking, how do we, how do we create that new norm? And, and I was a bit depressed in the beginning of the pandemic because a lot of the international efforts to reach agreement on, on Paris Agreement rule book and efforts to climate change seemed to be stalled a little bit. But, but what really brought back my hope was that actually in the last 12 months, we've seen major governments, emerging economies, really committing to ambitious targets by 2050. Uh, we've seen major businesses ramping up their climate ambition, uh, uh, committing to net zero target by 2050. And, and, and that gives me hope that, that now people are finally seeing climate change is not uh, 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 something that environmentalists or advocacy groups are, are shouting out for, but it's really central to the economic recovery. So we've seen a lot of governments introducing green stimulus packages, how, how green it is as a, as a separate question. So, so to me, at the end of this journey, I, I still see hope and light at the end of the tunnel that it's actually creating a momentum, a global movement that's really bringing climate 
change and sustainable, the need for sustainable development to the central, uh, uh, to the center of decision making and governance going forward. So for, from gold standard, we were fortunate. Um, uh, none of us were terribly affected by the pandemic. Of course, emotionally, I think personally, everybody was affected, but, but work-wise, um, yes, there are challenges because all of our projects are on site and require specific, you know, local stakeholder consultation, in-person visits and site visits, and those had to be uh, uh, delayed. So, so there are some sort of elements that are challenged due to lack of travel, lack of, you know, uh, because of the social distancing reasons. But overall, we're seeing huge increase in, in interest for carbon offsets and, and climate protection projects. So project developers are, the activities are increasing, project developers are busy uh, uh, addressing the, the increased demand signals from the market and corporates. We've seen corporates uh, commit to very ambitious targets, uh, which then inevitably forces them to, to really plan on how to get there. So, so I think from gold standards perspective, this pandemic and, and series of, of global issues have really uh, have surfaced the issue and, and, and made us to face that challenge. But it is true that, that we are living in a challenging time and, and global pandemic like COVID-19, it really, the, the most vulnerable communities are the most affected ones. Uh, due to climate change. So, and, and therefore I think it's, it's ever more important for corporates, governments, individuals, organizations, and communities to take that responsibility on climate action that's not only high environmental integrity and, and maximize sustainable development potential, but also put an equal importance on climate justice and societal values. So, so all in all, I, I still want to keep my hopes high. Uh, it has affected all of us, including myself, but, but I think it gives us a good opportunity to really revisit the values that we live on and, and the fact that we can't compromise uh, uh, climate change or the sustainable development issues for the economic recovery. And I, I strongly believe that these can go hand in hand. So for me, I, I speak a lot about environmental, social governance, sustainable development goals, uh, a lot are around environment, human health, things like this. And I've uh, been speaking that to large corporations, clear down to uh, individuals and uh, um, bottom up, top down, any, anyone who would, who would listen. And a, a, lot, a lot of people were kind of saying, oh, we're good, we'll wait, or it's, it's highly expensive, or it's difficult. And I, I, I switched back in... <clears throat> Uh, 2015 really firm and hard saying any event that I travel to must be carbon offset that there's there has to be this uh, taken into account it has to be an event that's thinking in this direction and whether that event did it or not that I was going to do it if I was going to attend and therefore that, that there need to be some kind of a balancing out and and when when I attended that event uh, Kind of with, with that in mind, I, I, when the pandemic hit, my phone, my email blew up. I mean, people were like, we didn't listen to you. How can you help us? How can we get back to business? I know you guys do on a much higher level. It's, a, it's the standard level. One, I'd like you to kind of explain just for those of us who have no clue what the gold standard does and is that, but also who, who is it for? Is it for corporations, cities, countries? Is it for individuals? And uh, in, the, in this crazy time, have you seen more influx of, of where you say, we need to raise the bar a little bit higher on standards, or we've had more people approaching us? Just kind of give us that journey on, on, on what it is and then what you've seen during this pandemic time. So, before I get into sort of a brief introduction of gold standard, what we believe in, in terms of principle is reduce within and finance beyond. And I'm gonna unpack that a little bit. I think all members of the global community has a role to play in addressing climate change. So whether that's a government, so 
governments has to reduce within their national boundaries. Uh, they set their um, nationally determined contribution targets according to the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, corporates need to, need to reduce within their corporate boundaries and finance beyond to achieve their net zero target. Individuals, we as, as global citizens, we need to reduce carbon footprint within our, our daily lives and, and be able to finance beyond. And, and oftentimes we all talk about urgency, that, that it had to be uh, addressed yesterday. But urgency often leads to hasty decisions and actions. And urgency often uh, uh, leads to greenwashing. So, so we need to make sure that we do it in the right way. And, and how, that's where Gold Standard comes in. So Gold Standard is, a, is an NGO based in Switzerland. We were, we were established in 2003. And since then, the, the, the mission of this organization is to ensure that climate security and sustainable development is for all. And, and in order to do that, how can a standard and, and verification and certification enable transparency, credibility, in articulating that impact, because it's so easy to easy to say I had an, a great impact on this project or I had a great impact on this by doing this, but how can you quantify that? How can you measure that? How can you report that? So for governments, there's clear measurement, reporting, verification requirements. Corporates also need to start putting that in place. Individuals, it's it's I, I do it all the time we should be able to measure our carbon footprint and, and reduce as much as we can. So the so gold standards role is to really provide tools and guidances and methodologies for these groups. So government, corporates and individuals to be able to use our methodology and, and offset through our schemes so that they can be reassured that they're not only guaranteed with that offset of, of carbon reduction, but also that you're creating uh, uh, additional impact, so additional sustainable development benefits. So, so to date, Gold Standard has about 1,800 climate protection projects all over the world in, in more than 70 countries. We, we contributed to certifying 150 million tons of CO2, uh, uh, leading to $23 billion of share value created. Um, when I say shared value, that refers to the sustainable development impact. So, so in that way, we're trying to make sure that not only we help these, these stakeholder groups to raise the ambition, but also make sure that you get there, you get to that goal in a transparent and a, in, a, in a credible way. So I always say you've got to reduce within and finance beyond, whether you're a government, corporate, uh, an organization or a city or uh, uh, an individual. That's beautiful. Um, really, I guess you're, what I hear out of it is that you're trying to make the best use of every dollar, euro, pound channel towards climate change. Um, although you are a foundation and kind of have ambitious goals, there are some, you don't have unlimited resources and funds and you're also uh, relying on many different um, actors to to come in and, and and to maximize this impact so that you really, you know, you want to maximize what you do in terms of mitigation, but also towards development outcomes, vulnerabilities towards communities and ecosystems. So I, I love I love hearing that. Um, does does that mean that you've you you kind of have not implemented new learnings or set the bar higher or i mean you did mention you know you you don't want to do any greenwashing you don't want to so hasty or or decisions but maybe if, if you haven't done that were there more people contacting gold standard or more of those organizations not just sustain cert but others that kind of work in conjunction with you as well that are coming in and saying Boy, we, you know, we've got to tweak this. We've got to fine tune our carbon calculators, our footprint calculators. We've got to raise the bar. We see that there's some holes in, in this area or, or that there was just more uptake. I mean, the, the crazy thing in, in, during this pandemic is 
is an economic downturn or crisis in many respects, but food and essential services and sustainability ESG outperformed conventional counterparts. And so the, when you talk about financials and investments and how your impact measures, those all basically explode and they're almost still on an exponential path, a critical mass of, of growth and movement. People like the uh, US with the new administration doubling down, making some real strong commitments and efforts to, to do things in, in better ways. And so I'd like to hear, you know, did you have any learning lessons? Did you uh, have any good stories or th things that you saw? Wow, you know, in a time where we should all be maybe burying our head in the sand or be totally afraid, those were the times where we, we pivoted on a dime and have, have made some stronger commitments or even realized what, what was going on. You know, that's, that's an interesting question because I've had quite a few wow moments in the last 12 months. Uh, and, and I've been in this field for quite a few years and, and this whole concept of, of greener growth or sustainable development always seemed to be sort of a UN thing or an NGO thing. And corporates love to use it as a green stamp for their investors or shareholders. In the last 12 months, I've had my wow moments when large corporations actually reached out to us or through their initiatives or through their foundations being very serious about setting the science-based target, for example, and, and really trying to understand how they get there. And it, 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 to me, I always thought I, I had a suspicion um, but it's, it's more and more clear to me that corporates are becoming serious about this and the consumers are smarter and, and they are being asked by investors. So I think it's a, it's, a, it's a systems approach where everybody's actually questioning and it's now coming to a point where corporates and, and certain sectors also have to respond to this, that in five, uh, five years ago, Maybe they didn't have to, or they just brushed it off. So, so for corporates, for example, it's it's clear because we at Gold Standard we we uh, uh, always advocate for the four steps for a corporate to to achieve their their net zero target. One, they have to measure and disclose carbon emissions. So their carbon accounting has to be robust and have a plan on how to get there. So reduce climate impact in line with your science-based target and, 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 and make sure that you finance emission reductions to compensate for residual emission beyond, uh, by investing in climate action beyond your boundaries. And finally, most importantly, advocate for that strong policy change. So, and, and it's, it's obvious to me nowadays that corporates are actually coming to us to think about what's the short-term, medium-term strategy. Because you can easily say, you know, as, a, as an employee working for a large corporation, you can say, okay, this is something that I don't have to worry about because I'll be retired by then when that judgment day comes. But, but people are serious. They wanna really build a division that really works on this and really understand what are high impact projects that they can invest in, how they can green their value chain, supply chain, how can they help their, their supplier farmers. So it's, it's a really um, integrated approach and a serious manner. So, so I'm, I'm, I've had some wow moments with some of the corporates that we've been working together and also governments. Uh, and, and surprisingly, it's not just the developed countries in Europe where, where I'm sitting in, but really some of the developing countries on the other side of the world is coming to us. Uh, government of Mongolia said we want to we really want to have a robust MRV system, integrated MRV system that can measure, verify, and report against our progress. I mean, these are the wow moments where you know I feel great about my job and 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 seeing that change, seeing that movement firsthand. So so I, I guess the the lesson learned is, you know, what the momentum is here, and we gotta build on it and and make it work in the right way. There, there's a couple of things within that as well. Um, 
what I've seen, and I want to, uh, I want to, maybe it, you have a story, or, or maybe you've seen this as well. Those uh, organizations, corporates that maybe before um, the pandemic, maybe even as far back as 2015 or even 2019, had already started moving and offsetting and, and a strong ESG. Because you mentioned those four four pillars that. In order to do it, you have to kind of address those and and what let's be honest, what that means is really a shift in your business model, how you report, how how you measure, how how you do those things, and then also how you speak about it. So now those those who have done that, you know, to, let's even say 2019, what what I've seen is they're they're coming now during. And, and as we hopefully emerge or move out of, uh, out of this craziness into the next craziness, that they're saying, wow, that was a better business model. We're so glad we did that because this, this, and this, we had resilience during this crazy time. We had social distancing. We had certain measures in place as we do business that really helped us during this time. It wasn't a strain that says, oh, we, we regret doing that because we could have used that money or that effort for something else we've seen total difference at least i have but i imagine you have as well is there anything in that respect that you've seen or or, or can you just concur that that you've seen seen that as well i i, I think um i'm pretty ambitious with the bar that i set for these large corporations so i i think there's still huge room for improvement. But I do give credit to some of these, these corporates that already started years back. So a lot, some of our, our corporates in the food beverage sector or agriculture sector have been involved with us since three, five years ago. And, and there's still challenges because for example, um, value chain or, or we call it scope three emission is still one of the most challenging element for corporates to reach net zero because the, the value chain, the, the supply chain scope three emissions are often the largest source of corporate carbon footprint. And yet to date, there's, there's very little uh, guidance or global recognition or, or tools that allow them to account for this and, and basically reduce it. So, so there's a lot of sort of um, uh, stakeholder groups that get together and we provide that with Sustain Cert, a platform where they can come in and share their challenges and develop a, a, a guidance or a tool together to, to think about, you know, there's uncertainty about who's responsible for these indirect emissions, you know, there's limited access to supplier uh, data. What about, you know, the shared farming, um, uh, lack of guidance. So all these challenges are still there. And if we don't address these, and if we don't create a, a consensus around that, what we're going to see and what corporates are going to claim will not be credible. So, so to me, if, if, I mean, I, you know, some, some media release was there on, you know, some companies claiming net zero by today, like it, it's not possible. So, so how do we, how do we move towards that in a phased approach? And how do we bring different stakeholders into this so we bring consensus? Because a corporate can hire a few brilliant people and just pretend that this is it and, and claim that we're net zero by 2050. But, but who's gonna verify that? What are the, the steps to do that? So, so to me, I'm not, I don't want to be, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that some companies are actually seeing the change of business model profiting them. Uh, I probably don't have like a concrete example to share, but I've heard from our colleagues in those corporates, in the sustainability divisions that they're really integrating the CSR, the sustainability division decisions into the corporate decision-making, which I think is a huge step forward. But in terms of the profitabil profitability of the company, I think we're going to need a few more years to really see the evidence. And once that evidence is triggered and shared publicly, communicated, I think that's when, when all the companies, the rest of the corporate sector who hasn't really bought into the idea, 
will join in. So, so I'm, I'm very thankful to be working with some of the pioneering corporates right now, uh, especially in Europe, um, to tackle some of these challenges. There, there was so that brings up a bunch of areas we could dive a little bit deeper in. I, I, I kind of maybe we'll just tickle the surface and go in in a few. So, in, in some respects, I'm hearing your position on on the term or climate neutral claims that companies use today. There are several of them. One, the best example probably is Delta Airlines and uh, Valentine's Day 2020 uh, before the pandemic hit. Says we're going to March first. We're going to be uh, 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 carbon neutral, climate neutral. Um, <clears throat> what, what, can you tell us a little bit more about your position or is that, a, is that a touchy subject? Is that something we shouldn't be doing yet? Or is there, or do you think, no, they're in the, they're moving in the right direction or can you give us a little more understanding on when companies say that, what it means, how we should look at it, what the reality is? I think we need to sort of move away from carbon neutral uh, 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 statement. And, and to me, it's very clear that, that for corporates, for large corporates, there's a clear body, clear global body that sets the, the target. So, so there's the uh, science-based targets in initiative group uh, comprised of a number of uh, uh, respected NGOs. Uh, including WWF, WRI in the States, and, and, and UN Compact and CDP and others. And, and basically corporates have to submit their targets. And that's first, to align with science. And, and then you basically have to follow the four steps I, I shared earlier to, to reach that target. And, and it is true, there's very little sort of global level frameworks or guidances that's, that's clearly given to the corporates. And that's why we're sort of in that transition period where we need to bring that consensus and that, that sort of um, understanding how to account for how to report. Until then, I feel like you can just, you can just say it. Um, and, and consumers will not know. And, and I work in this field, but if I talk to my grandmother, if, if she's booking an airline ticket and the airlines is were carbon neutral, she's going to believe it. So, so I think it, it's an effort by all parties. So corporates need to follow the, the net zero target and how to get there, sort of the, that structure. And, and consumers also need to be educated. Um, how to differentiate uh, uh, greenwashing versus non. So, so I think, and, and also globally, there has to be a, a framework that supports these corporates to make sure that these informations are, uh, these information is clearly transparently disclosed and consumers have access to that. So I, I think it's an effort from all parts and NGOs and CSOs need to be watching how these corporates actually move on their commitment. So, so to me, I, I think it's, and it, it's hard because this industry has so many jargons and it seems like every five to 10 years, the, the next trend changes, how we call the same concept changes. And, and that really bothers me. It's simple. We got to reach net zero by 2050 and According to Paris Agreement, we need to balance the, the carbon emission with carbon six by mid-century. I mean, it, it's simple, goal. Well, how do we get there is a question we need to all answer. So, so to me, there's no point of using these different jargons to, to package it. And, and I really hope that global community or, or the bodies that govern this or bodies that lead this this uh, sort of streamlines um, uh, terminologies, concepts, and definitions, so that consumers and and the layman people who who every day go through without thinking about climate change every day are are, are clear on what they're getting. There, I think there are so many. I mean, we we could really go deep because um, one, there's the the greenwashing, but uh, the other one is you know. Um, airlines saying we're carbon neutral and things, but they're 
also, in some respects also putting the onus back onto the 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 passenger, the consumer to book a carbon neutral flight or to do offsetting through through their booking process, where it would almost be better that 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 was already included in the package from the beginning that they says, no, we'll take care of that. And that's just somehow included in the price and in the total experience that, that they're doing that uh, for you. There's this other <clears throat> uh, thing around uh, greenwashing. And I don't know what you're, we've touched upon it a couple of times. And th this kind of leads me into the, the dispelling the myth of offsetting, uh, but we're, we'll touch on that in a moment. And it's really, um, I, I have this feeling and I've seen it over time. Greenwashing, if, to me, is fake it until you make it. A lot of organizations are like totally bullshitting. There's greenwashing like crazy. And then they're like, we're getting such positive response. We're, you know, I, I, you know, I think the dialogue is a, a little bit different. But even if they are greenwashing and it's total BS, there's this thing that comes forward is, wow, our, our consumers, our contractors, our partners are, 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 we're getting such good resonance and we really didn't mean it that eventually after a year or two or, or, or more, they're like, there's something to this. This, this could be a better model. Um, uh, the biggest way that I deal with it is, and, and, and you've probably seen this as well as that well, a lot of organizations and institutes will come to me and ask for help on on reporting. They'll they'll do it at the end of their reporting year when they're you know after the year's done, and they say, okay, we've got to see what SDGs we can fit in to this year's worth of reporting. What actions do we take during this year that we can fit into our report and say, oh, this is what we did. Well. That doesn't work. That, that that that's not reality. That's uh, you know, um, it's the beginning of the year. You you set actions and targets, and and you have these fun things based on actions, and then you can report on all the positive successes at the end of the year, and, as well as what you didn't achieve and didn't happen. But it's a much better narrative. It's a much better journey and story, more rallying of your consumers and everybody where you're saying, hey, we just went on that. We, we had these actions that we set out for at the beginning of the year. We reached them all. We blew by them. It's a better model. It was fun. Our employers, our consumers, our partners, they were all so excited. And let, let us report on how we achieved and, and reached these goals or shot beyond them. Whereas some people say, okay, what SDGs can we fit there? How, what did we do for sustainability and that can we can squeeze into reporting? Why even do it? It's a waste of time. You haven't done nothing. You're just business as usual. You're just reporting how you're continuing slower in the wrong direction. And so with that, I mean, that's what I've seen. If you fake it to make it, unless you just you just don't care and and nobody can see behind the 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 uh the curtains uh you're just bsing yourself but a lot of people are saying wow this really does work maybe we should look into really changing our model i think fake it till you make it might have worked 10 years ago in a sense you know you had time to fake it but do we have that time and i i really don't think we have that time so to me, now it's not about faking. Either you get serious or you don't care about it. And I, I don't think we can change all minds of major corporate CEOs. But there will be peer pressure. If, if within an industry, if one leader starts to change their business model and get serious about it, it's inevitable that that will have a ripple effect on its competitors. So to me, we don't have time to fake it. And, and it, it really drives me crazy when I think about SDG washing. It's beyond belief. I mean, people just put that beautiful, you know, the rainbow color on top of whatever, and they say, we're creating impact. Says who? And, and that's where, and, and I completely agree with you, Mark, on the point that people retrofit it in towards the end, and, and it shouldn't be. And I think, when you think of UN SDGs, people often think this is a UN thing. Or if I go to developing countries, people often say, oh, this is a foreign ministry uh, led initiative, but it shouldn't be. It's a, it's a planning tool. 
it should be integrated into everything you do as a government, as a corporate, as, a, as an individual, and maybe it's a marketing issue. This is not on its own uh, a goal. I think it's, it's basically, how do we integrate all SDGs into everyday life of every group that's existing on this earth? I think it's simple as that. So how do we empower women? How do we, how do we preserve our biodiversity? How do we uh, uh, improve our energy efficiency? I mean, these things shouldn't be a, a separate topic. It should be really embedded into corporate decision-making, everyday individual decision-making, government decision-making. And it, it, it really kills me to think that people are just using as a stamp at the end of the, the report just to show that they tried, you know? And, and that just can't happen. So, so for me, that's where sort of goal standards SDG tools come in handy. As, as a project developer, as a government, you can use these tools in the very outset of a planning to see how you want to monitor what's your what's your target impact how you progress towards that and actually verify it and say we did create x number of jobs we empowered x number of women we increased the 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 uh, graduation rate of girls in school and and we improved the air quality improved the livelihoods of people so so it's not about let's retrofit in some nice societal values at the end of a project, but really starting from the outset. And that's what makes goal standard projects very unique because you have to do that from the very design phase. And, and I think corporates also need to do the same and governments as well and individuals. This kind of leads me into dispelling the myth. I want you to dispel the myth of, so, uh, many conversations over the years about offsetting. I was one of the first trained by Al Gore as a climate mentor leader and, and that, and, and he's done offsetting for, for years. And, and, and that's kind of the initial place where, where the discussions have got into, but it's uh, everywhere from corporate to governments to cities have had this, um, that, uh, that almost offsetting is, is an excuse of non-action inaction. So, to, so to say, well, what are your thoughts and can you dispel that myth for us? So before joining Gold Standard, I have to say I also had doubts of the offsetting market. And, and I still believe that there are rooms for improvement for the offsetting market. And, and I often say, you know, some critiques come to me and say, it's a way for guilty to pay for absolution rather than, than changing their behavior. And I can completely disagree because there are corporates who are taking this path. And, and, it's, and that's why it's very critical for standards like gold standard who's operating in this, in this market without a regulatory framework. It's important that standards like us make sure we stand for the highest environmental integrity and maximize sustainable impact of the projects that we review and certify. And, and, and that gives the, the buyers of these offset uh, uh, carbon assets the confidence that they're not only guaranteed of one-to-one, -one, so one credit means one uh, ton of CO2 uh, reduced somewhere, that guarantee plus the potential, um, the, the sustainable development impact they're having through purchasing this credit. So, so with that, I, I think offsetting, another myth is there's a huge hype about offsetting right now. Uh, you know, Mark Carney uh, task force was launched and there's an ambition to scale, you know, 10, 15 folds. I have to say, even if it's scaled, carbon market, the carbon finance is drop in the bucket. If you think about the trillions of dollars that needs to be mobilized to achieve the Paris Agreement, to achieve the sustainable development goals. So offsetting, I feel like is used by a lot of people as a, as a, as a tool to sort of bring up this hype. But if you really look at it from a macro perspective, it's just drop in the bucket. But it is an important drop because I think it is, it is a very catalytic financing mechanism. 
So it leverages private finance. It, it goes to the marginalized communities otherwise wouldn't have access carbon finance or finance. So, so to me, offsetting should not be seen as a standalone measure, but really be looked at from a holistic approach. And, and, and offsetting shouldn't be an, an instead of tool. So every stakeholder group, whether that's government who's offsetting, corporate that's offsetting, or individual like you and me offsetting, we should try as much as we can to reduce within and use the offsetting to finance beyond. So, so I, I do agree with you that there are some areas this market has to improve, but, but I still strongly believe that it's a strong catalytic mechanism uh, uh, to, to support the people who are reducing within and trying to finance beyond. And another element uh, uh, that has to be tackled is transparency. You know, uh, some, some journalist or someone told me once, it's like a black hole. Uh, and, and it is true, the pricing is completely under the table. We don't have that visibility. Um, it's a structured market. Uh, it's run by the market players. So even as a standard, we don't have clear view on all the pricing of our credits uh, being traded in the market at, at different levels. So, so I think transparency is another uh, uh, area the market players as a whole needs to improve. Uh, we have registry that's publicly uh, available for people to access. And also, um, we need to find ways to bring that transparency out through the Mark Carney's task force working groups. So, so yeah, there are myths, but, but I think um, being part of gold standard, leading gold standard, I'm, I'm very excited to really improve that strength in the market mechanism going forward to align with science. I love that. So, I mean, we we could keep getting into, I guess, some not black holes, but some rabbit holes of, of different topics because we we just we we can tell this is a definitely an onion with with many layers that we could go into. Um, there, uh, I, I kind of in, in this point, I think it's it's good, uh, and, and we'll go back to grow to zero in a minute. But I, I think we should take this in a direction for a minute. I want to know um, what gold standard stake is in technical solutions such as carbon capture and storage. And could it be beneficial for um, projects and solutions if gold standard would also establish some new kind of certification to open new markets? The reason I ask that is, is for a couple of reasons. So the, the, the world's biggest business opportunities are also the world's biggest problems, you know, so the, the, the human suffering and our global grand challenges, it's not a way to make money off of human suffering and that, but it's also an opportunity uh, that many people can see the bigger picture. And, and a lot of large organizations are really jumping in and offering planetary services, environmental services, in addition to their to their business, you know, what, what, no matter what they do, they have some kind of a section that they want to, this thought process, leave the planet better than they found it. It's not just the bare minimum of offsetting or, it, you know, and, and this is where we'll talk about grow to zero in a minute, but it's also um, one great ambition happened in 2020 uh, uh, before the pandemic was also, it was in January, I believe, for Microsoft, they made these huge ambitions, but one of the ambitions says that they're going to remove their historical carbon emissions since they've been in business, right? Uh, and I believe it was by 2050 that they'll remove all their historical carbon emissions. I mean, most people, what what's that about? That uh, how do I understand that? Since they've been in business, every product they've produced, every emission that they've had since that time, they're going to remove it. And that's this kind of step in the right direction. This is leaving the planet better than they found it, or at least getting to that balance so that now what we're seeing is direct air capture, uh, carbon capture. We're seeing storage things come about, but we're seeing more organizations offer these planetary services um, to almost go beyond and say, okay, how can if I'm going to start a business or if I'm going to be in business, I need to make sure that the only impact I have on the planet is, is net positive. That's a really positive impact. 
there's a new book coming out in September from a Andrew Winston and uh, Paul Pullman from former C CEO of Unilever. It's called Net Positive, and it's kind of moving more in this direction that why do the bare minimum? Why just do carbon offsetting, do the bare minimum? This is the standard. We've got to do this GRI reporting. Wouldn't it be a better model to go above and beyond and leave the planet better than we found it and actually be net positive? And, and so I, I know you're still kind of dealing with just getting people up to speed on, on this one level, but what if we set the bar higher and said, hey, there's an even better model, you know? And so that's, I, I kind of wanted to get your views and your points on that. And then I want to go back and talk about grow to zero. I think that's an excellent point. And I think that's the, the key sort of drive for gold standard. So yes, on technical, uh, aspect. We are still working with our stakeholders to get to where we should be today, but the, the thought leadership, the growth to zero, the, the, the advocacy we're having is how do we go beyond that and how do we use offset? Because they, these whole myth of offset is coming from doing the bare minimum. How can we use the market mechanisms to create that positive like quote unquote positive scenario. If everybody's reducing within reaching net zero and using the offsetting market to, to compensate for the residual emission as a corporate, for example, you're actually reaching for the positive scenario. So, so how do we shift that ambition of the market? And, and this, is a, this is a challenging one. And we've been, our, our CTO and our team has been really driving this consultation with NGOs, with corporates. And, and of course, some of the progressive ones are really driving at that, but, but still we have a huge population we still need to uh, uh, bring with us. So, so to me, um, I always say carbon market shouldn't cover all projects. Carbon market or market mechanism shouldn't cover all project types. I mean, right now, the main three are energy, land use, and community-based projects. But, but nowadays, everybody's trying to bring every possible project type into the market mechanism, given the hype. But can you ensure permanence? Can you ensure integrity of these projects? If not, then we shouldn't entertain that in the market because there's other mechanisms like climate finance. So for example, Gold Standard works with a consortium of partners uh, uh, like private equity, uh, uh, Pegasus Capital based in the US, BNP Paribas, Bank in uh, Paris, uh, Bank in France, and, and few NGOs uh, uh, working on uh, infrastructure projects and conservation issues like IUCN and R20. We created, a, a $750 million private equity fund to support small to medium size, uh, micro to small size infrastructure projects in developing countries at a subnational city level. And, and gold standards role is to verify, monitor and, and, and measure and verify that impact at, at a fund level as well as at a project level. So we're saying not all projects need to force fit into offsetting scheme. But there's plenty of finance out there that you can access. So, so to me, it's, it's really having that macro view of what finances are available and where's the need and, and fitting that right into uh, strategizing, putting that strategy in place uh, to make sure you access finance accordingly based on the criteria that your investment, um, your, your investment potential has. So so are you telling me that right now, maybe that those technical solutions, carbon capture, storage, some of those other things are kind of ones that you're really haven't decided on yet that you're kind of holding off and maybe there are some other markets. And, and I, you can see why I mention it, not only because of the Microsoft, but it was just a few months ago or not even a month ago that Elon Musk come out and said, you know, carbon capturing type of a, of, of, of a prize or to, to the person who can do it, things like that. People are really looking for technical solutions to, yeah. to save and solve some of our climate change problems. And uh, um, I, I guess, I, I guess I wanna know 
do you think that they will do this? Uh, will these technical solutions solve our, our problem? Or, uh, or you, you're just focusing in on these areas right now and that could be expanded in the future? No, I, I think we, as a standard, we need to continuously explore technical solutions. And that's, I think that's the, the solution for future that, that uh, new technologies need to be tested. And in the project types we have, these need to be taken into consideration. So we are actually reviewing carbon storage, uh, carbon capture methodologies, and we are reviewing um, a potential expansion in removals portfolio using nature-based solutions, project types. But, but the, the conclusion of it is, of course, we will come out with consultations and, and we will develop based on the consultation outcomes. But the, the, the point I wanted to make is that not all project types are fit for the market mechanisms. Okay, now, now I definitely want to get into grow, grow to Zero has been around since Marian uh, was CEO as well. And I'd like you to maybe take us a little bit deeper in, into this, uh, if you can explain that and what, what, the, what, what is the Grow to Zero? So by 2030, um, Paris Agreement, SDG, aim for, we're saying zero extreme poverty, zero hunger, zero deforestation uh, and biodiversity loss, net zero emission. And, and I think we've come to a point where we now know that this whole myth about, oh, sustainability measures need to come at expense of economic growth. I think that's proven wrong. And I, and I think there's very much a global consensus around everything has to go hand in hand. So economic growth, the environmental integrity and pre uh, preserving environment, natural resources, and uh, preserving societal values, improving societal values, all of these three elements in the triangle, they have to be balanced and they have to go together. So, so growth to zero for us is not a, a, an individual project or an individual initiative, but it really governs our everyday life at Gold Standard, uh, going from governance decisions to our project reviews, to standard setting, to our partnership engagement, to mobilizing resources and communicating. Basically, Grow to Zero is a concept that's embedded in every step of our organization. So, so that's what Grow to Zero is about for Gold Standard. Uh you also kind of say it's kind of a, a race to net zero, right? Uh, would that have to do that you really want to get everybody on the exponential curve, the exponential function to operate? You know, there pe people hear the exponential function and, and, and they're like, well, I don't understand that. That's a little complex. But we saw with the pandemic how exponentially fast the, the pandemic grew and around the world spread around the world. But there's not just the negative way of, of the exponential function, there's a positive way through critical mass and different ways to, to use the exponential function to almost like you say, race to net zero. There's also the, the, uh, uh, the uh, exponential roadmap to the sustainable development goals to the Paris Agreement uh, because we've had nine year or yeah, is it? no, because we've had six years now of almost in action or, or uh, very little traction or movement, now we're starting to reach that critical mass and getting hopefully towards this exponential commitments and, and growth to reaching the, the goal and target by 2030. And specifically, I guess you guys have a, a very firm belief in the sustainable development goals and how to look at them, how to use them, and how, why and how we should achieve them. Can you maybe, if you don't mind, going a little bit more into how the gold standard really ties to the global goals? Why is it important? What, what do you see how we should be looking at them, how they're made for each and every individual and what's kind of your stance on that? So so sustainable development goal is a fundamental element of, of all of our goal standard projects and grow to zero and you mentioned race to zero so that's the the COP26 sort of the, the big campaign 
and where we slightly see it differently. I, I'm sure the, the race to zero is also seeing it in a similar way, but race to zero means we need to race to net zero. Where we're saying is we need to grow to zero. So we're not just racing to reach net zero, but we need to make sure that we're looking at this holistically at opportunities for positive societal, economic and environmental impact. So it's not just environmental net zero, but really looking at societal element as well. And, and for us, that, that really is integrated into all of our projects. So for example, um, taking SDG five, uh, empowering women. So we have a gender sensitive, uh, gender responsive framework where all projects that go through our, our system uh, has to do a deep dive gender analysis, local stakeholder consultation, and make sure they report against SDG 5. And, and basically, uh, for example, if there's a, a project in, in northern Uganda where we're trying to improve the safe water supply uh, for the, the households, um, by implementing that project, and by setting that gender responsive um, targets, we're seeing results. For example, uh, the time spent by women and children fetching water, like two to three hours were saved. Uh, uh, and that saved time can, can translate into economic activities. And, and in the consultations, for example, the local water, commu uh, water committee sort of has gender balance because, because of this project. Uh, and, and is monitoring that. So, so it's not necessarily really looking at it separately, but as part of building this carbon project or climate protection project, project developers are integrating these measures from the very outset and delivering the monitoring report to actually get that impact certified. So, so that's how we see sustainable development um, in this. It's not a separate sort of UN thing, but it's just part of the project. And, and how do we maximize that impact is I think is a bigger question than just reaching net zero. If we're doing harm society, uh, harm on societal values and just reaching net zero, I think that's not a fair game. So how do we bring that balance is really the fundamentals of UN SDGs. I absolutely love that. You, you know, I, I speak about them a lot. I'm an advocate for the SDGs and they are definitely not just an add-on to business as usual. We just don't plug them or ch cherry pick them and put them into business as usual and then say, okay, that's all right. They're a brand new first ever global moonshot, a global operating system that raises the bar higher. And really when we achieve them, they set a solid uh, uh, foundation and infrastructure for us to really springboard off into a lot of other solutions that we're still facing uh, well into the future, give us more resilience and get us more into restoration and re regeneration. The, the discussions over the decades that I've had within the UN and the World Economic Forum <clears throat> really are what, you know, what are the top 10 ways? What are the top 100 ways that we can draw down and fix our human suffering issues, our uh, environmental problems, our global grand challenges? And for a long time, uh, um, there was a lot of, there was no unity, no unification in, in this discussion. Nobody knew you'd hear 15 different answers, 100 different answers, and, and it wasn't really unified. And so I'm so glad for the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, in, in my list of the top four, um, empowering women and girls always comes in there. It's the biggest impact, especially even if you look at Paul Hawkins' Drawdown book, and he's getting ready to, to, to come out with a new book called uh, Regeneration, um, which is kind of the sequel to the Drawdown and, and moving in that similar direction. Um, empowering women and girls is so, so vital. You, you, you just mentioned that as one of the SDGs and one of the frameworks that, you guys started that in 2018, it was basically your standard requirements to this gender frame uh, equality framework. And I absolutely love that. And I, I love the, the, you know, the work and that you mentioned that because I, I, I 
no, no one better than uh, a, a, a wonderful person like you and a woman to empower women and girls and spread that message. And I'll, I always feel a little uncomfortable when I'm spreading the message of women and girls, hairy old guy, uh, um, you know, saying that and they're like, what does that have to do? And, but it is such a huge impact on our world. And I really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, I, I guess my first controversial uh, question I really have for you today that, that moves into this, the global goals uh, are really, how do you feel about global citizenry, a world without nations and borders and divisions of humanity, one from another, but more so maybe some global operating systems, some global solutions for us all, similar to the Paris Agreement and towards the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and also maybe gold standards uh, feelings on that because you work with or organizations and, and countries and cities all over the earth. A world without borders. Um, it's, it's a really interesting question. and. And, and the concept of sort of global citizen, the world without borders, it, it's been resonating in my head for a while. And, and people often say, oh, are you a global citizen? I am, I, I'm a person of color or I work with diverse groups or I work in X number of countries. I mean, personally, I myself as a Korean American, having brought up in the US and South Korea, worked in South Korea and working in Switzerland, I definitely, don't see the, the, the borders constraining me. And I work with a diverse group of people, but I don't see that as a definition of global citizen. To me, global citizen is having that awareness where, and I'll, I'll probably give a very simple example. Um, I'm brushing my teeth and I'm running water and without knowing I'm running water for two minutes. And and as a global citizen, I think all of us need to be aware that that water that's been wasted for two minutes can serve a house, a family, or a group of families in the other side of the world. And a product you buy at a grocery shop today is affecting lives of farmers across the border. Uh, uh, you go to the bank in your pension fund, the, the investment the pension fund decides to make is investing in green investments or, or brown investments, whatever we want to call it, that affect the lives of people on the other side of the world. So to me, being a true global citizen is being aware that my action at this moment, at this time, is having an impact somewhere else. And we are sharing natural resources. There's no borders for natural resources. Some countries are just lucky to have abundance of natural resources and some countries aren't. And some countries were lucky to be industrialized quicker and some countries are just catching up. So we're sharing that global resource and how do we do that fairly and, and balanced way? And I think global citizen means we recognize and be aware that we're part of that global community that's sharing resources that's given to us freely and how to do that responsibly. Responsibly, I think that's where the, the global citizenship concepts uh, resonates with me. And, and the borders, I, I feel like, I, I think I read a study long back a few years ago where they did a study on what if you didn't have a border between two countries of similar size, similar GDP versus, you know, a rich and poor, and then did a study and both concluded that economically it's beneficial without a border. And, but at the same time, I feel like we're all human beings. We need to be part of a community, part of a culture. And, and I think it's really about being respectful of the difference. So the, those borders create that difference inevitably. And how do we respect that with or without borders? And I think that resonates back to, you know, the, the hate crimes, the, the, the racism that we face in the US and, and all over the world. And, and I feel like global citizenship is really being aware of these things and, and being responsible for your action. 
and, and knowing that your action one day or at this moment is affecting someone else, some somebody else's life and their families. So gold standard, I think we, we believe in the same concept. We, we, we sit here to make sure that there's equity, there's better equality, there's, there's less scarce resources and there's more balance in the resources we use and, and the, the global resources we have because we're so fortunate to be living on earth. And, and how do we make sure that we, we, we preserve that and do it in a credible and measurable way so you know, people aren't just putting labels on it? Well, I thank you for, for explaining that so eloquently. And uh, uh, you definitely um, got the concept and idea and, and, and uh, portrayed it so nicely. Just gold standard or even carbon offsetting in, a, in and of itself. One, one, a lot of people don't know that carbon offsetting is not just CO2, it's all greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but also, those emissions don't hold to borders. They're like species, they're like nature, they're like wind and water and air. Mm -hmm. They are move all around this earth. We're all on the same planet. Earth. So it's very difficult to, you know, we can calculate to, to a certain degree of accuracy, a, a footprint of a company and, and, and uh, the, the, how we should do some, some the bare minimum offsetting uh, in a good way. Um, but this, the greenhouse gas emissions, you know, the 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 emissions that uh, for the Amazon rainforest is burning uh, was burning in, in Brazil, it affects us all over the world. It just doesn't remain in those borders, and so we need to really uh, that in conjunction to what you so eloquently see, kind of have have that greater vision. And, and there's plus and minuses. It's not a disappearance of culture and beliefs and and even even where you're born, but it's also on the other hand that just because you were born in some impoverished place doesn't mean that you're also entitled to the basic needs uh, of somewhere else that we would receive in America or in Europe or Germany or, or wherever you are in the world that uh, we're all breathing the same air. We're breathing the same recirculated air that Gandhi and Caesar and whoever else in the world in history ha has breathed. And there is, really no place on this earth that we can hide from climate change or hide from Nothing. our our environment, our climate, our air, our water. If we drink, it, it eventually will reach us all if we're here long enough. Um, the, the, the next hardest question I have for you is truly the burning question. I ask all my guests this and it's WTF, the burning question. And it's not what you would say or think the swear word but it's what's the futures and i want to know from you and, and maybe gold standard what's the futures what's the direction and what's the plan where we're going that's that's a second overwhelming question uh, after your first question uh, the future i mean just very simply it has to be a better place and I'm not saying we'll be conflict-free in the future. I'm not saying we'll be uh, uh, just abundant with natural resources in the future. But, but all the fight we're doing, all the effort this generation is putting in should result in something that's better for our next generations. So I hope the future will look more fair and equal. Men and women, different ethnic ethnicity groups, um, countries, cultures. I hope the future won't suffer from extreme hunger or poverty. That the future, our next generations don't have to worry about depleting, uh, depleted natural resources. That, that the next generation, uh, the next generations will prosper with with technology and efficiency and all of that i think I, I know this is very theoretical but but that's what we're working towards and I, I think that's the sense of my purpose as an individual as a professional and also as gold standard that's what we're headed towards and in that of course there are technical things we need to do to to uh, raise the ambition of the market mechanisms we work in 
provide tools for the corporates to, to achieve their targets in a transparent and credible way and, and climate and development finance to, to developing countries need to be measured and, and reported properly and we'll do that. But, but the real future I hope to see is a better place for everyone. I, I truly hope so, and I, I love how how you describe that. I want to go. It's not. It's not really a step back, but we, you know, we're talking about the Paris Agreement, and we're talking about uh, the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. So we've got before the decade's out, nine years left. Um, I, I, I really want to go into offsetting specifically in the framework or the guidance of the Paris Agreement. Um, what can you tell me there? What, is there support and help for you there? Or is it old, vintage, outdated uh, things um, that are kind of still offsetting climate neutrality under, under the Paris Agreement or what, what is your understanding? How is the Paris Agreement helping with offsetting and moving us in that right direction? It's, it's a very timely question because we just concluded the consultation uh, as gold standard on aligning our gold standard for the global goals with the Paris. And it, it is a controversial or I would say heated discussion. Um, but fundamentally, everything has to align. If, if we have small groups in the corner doing its own thing and it's, it's neglecting the, the global sort of efforts to account for carbon emission, this mechanism will not be credible. So for us, it's important that we align with science and we hope that that means Paris Agreement. And we will be considering some new rule updates, for example, corresponding adjustment. So uh, uh, that's the most contentious topic right now. And, and I'll, I won't speak too much about it, uh, but, but we are actually getting very good constructive feedback from the market players, as well as NGOs, CSOs, and governments on how to practically implement this and what are some of the grace periods and transition support they need. So it's, it's been a really tremendously uh, helpful discussion, challenging one, but, but we hope to come out with some announcements fairly quickly in this year. Is, that, is this almost like stock cleaning or is this something else that, uh, that we're talking about here? What, what do you mean stock cleaning? Like market or stock cleaning of, of um, these impactful climate actions through the Paris Agreement as it kind of, we've got to fine tune and it really get some more clarity on them or is it this something else? No, I think it's your, your spot on in a sense, it's not cleaning I would say, but it's really how do we bring the market and raise that ambition to align with science? Because the market hasn't really thought about that from a macro perspective. So we're driving that conversation to see if we can align that. And, and of course, you know, uh, uh, we're only one standard and one body of a market player group. So we need to make sure we're transparently consulting and, and, and hearing feedback before we come out with some, some concrete actions. So um, you, you guys do do certification for um nature-based solutions such as forestry, land use, things like that. Um, I w I, I've been in this for, for a while, but I mean, it was really around 2014 when you guys started making some more um, um, bigger projects and certifying things around this. Why was that and why did it change and kind of, um, because now, I mean, every, er, everywhere, it's like everybody's doing planetary and land and, and even in the news, you know, we're hearing about Bill Gates. He's doing this carbon farming, buying up tons of, of land. And then, and, and, you know, I have probably 16 friends besides Felix Finkbeiner who are all doing some kind of one trillion trees, uh, plant for the planet, whatever, you know, whatever. I, I want to kind of 
hear your take on re reforestation project projects, what we should be aware of, because right now people are being faced with that. I can't not tell you probably just this week alone, I've had um, already five people say, hey, buy a tree, buy this section or, or you know, do this offsetting. What should we be looking for? What's the certifying? And maybe can you go into the to more of that? So just clear up what we should be looking at, what lens we should have on in this respect, and, and what your guys' stance or, or direction of move for, for land use and forestry is. I know it's, I, mean, I put you on the spot, it might be harder, but I know, want to kind of get into the sense making of that. No, it's it's important question. Um, nature based solutions are fundamental part of, you know, climate action and biodiversity. And, and I think it was last year when UN Secretary General said, he cited um, some studies saying NBS can provide like one third of, of cost effective climate mitigation um, needed to reach the targets. And, and to, to me, um, nature-based solutions a critical um, uh, area where we need to work on because it also includes uh, addressing societal challenges, which include food security, climate change, water security, human health, disaster risk, all of that. So, so NBS is a is a core priority for gold standard, and and we are actually uh, really expanding into. Uh, exploring what solutions there are and what project types there are for the offsetting market. But I have to say, um, we don't, and, and this is for the listeners who are familiar with the forestry sector projects, they know the differentiation between uh, reforestation projects versus avoided deforestation projects, but we don't support, support all kinds of, pro, uh, we don't support all kinds of forestry projects because, because of the environmental integrity issue and the longer term permanence issue. And, and for reforestation project, I, we have a good example in for uh, Panama, where, you know, sourcing timber for from the rainforest, the, the primary rainforest, um, and timber trade has significantly depleted the, the tropical rainforest. So one of our project is introducing sustainable timber produ production while reforest, uh, reforesting degraded uh, pasture lands um, with mix of sort of the native tree species and teak and, and whatnot to ensure that we recreate the na natural habitat and preserve the natural habitat for native animals and plants. So, so it's important that, that, that the project developers or the, the buyers of offset claims or offset credits are aware of the implication of these projects. Like what's the project impact and benefit and how much of that is guaranteed? And some forestry projects are not guaranteed. So, so how do you make sure that, that you offset with a credible nature-based solutions in the market mechanism? So, so I personally believe that nature-based solutions has much more place with climate finance. Um, and, and there are narrow scope of nature-based solutions that can fit into the market mechanism where we need to guarantee one-to-one, -one, one credit to one emission reduction. So planting trees, it's such a great marketing tool and you tell your grandmother and she'll understand but what if it's burned down after 25 years? Or what if that planting tree displaced indigenous people in the forest? Or what if that, that depleted uh, 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 preserved animals in, in the, the habitat? So, so these safeguards, these, these permanence issues, these um, uh, environmental integrity issues need to be addressed. And, and I know it, this can go into much more technical details, but, but to me, uh, Forestry is a sensitive topic, yeah, but, but I, I, I do believe in the power of nature-based solutions, but not necessarily all of them will fit into the markets. Yeah, some of the domestic authorities or the, there's a danger of corruption. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of more interested or focused in on, um, I really want some of these 
and to empower from the bottom up the really small holders, the smaller community based projects um, that have tremendous local SDG impacts, even though they might because they might even be indigenous, they might not be aware that it's the SDGs, but because it's indigenous wisdoms and ways of doing things, uh, there is a huge impact towards the SDGs and the Paris Agreement that really the, that these the these smaller base communities don't qualify for corresponding adjustments. Uh, the, uh, they're too small. And it would really be a pity if we couldn't find some kind of a me mechanism that, that to get these, these communities into the market or to exclude them from the market and say, no, it's too small, it's too community, that, that we, it would really be nice to see if we could figure out some solutions there. And uh, maybe I'm, you know, I'm a dreamer. I want to save the world and have these, but uh, you know, that's kind of why I brought up a, a lot of that as well. No, I think that's spot on. Uh, we're, I mean, clearly one of our unique uh, portfolio mixture is the, the huge portfolio of community-based projects, especially in the most vulnerable communities. And we are very well aware of the challenges and the cost of, of getting the project certified. So we are very much committed to address that and make sure that they're not further marginalized or they're not marginalized in this transition period. I only have um, really four more questions for you. Um, three are really easy. And the last one is uh, a more, do you, I wouldn't even say it's hard. It's just, it's really what we discussed earlier about <clears throat> getting the standard to a much higher standard or my a much higher operating system for businesses cities the world in general um instead of doing the bare minimum what would you think if, if we just say you know what if you're going to be in business uh you've got to have remove all your historical carbon emissions or you've got to offer a strong planetary services where you're net positive do you see us really getting there anytime soon do you think it will take beyond this next decade of action beyond 2030 or do you think there's some mechanisms that we could just set the bar a little bit higher for for the world and Instead of, I mean, we've got we've gotten into this horrible mode of bureaucracy and debate and policy and doing the bare minimum, and that that leads to corruption. It leads to so many other things where they say, okay, we're doing the bare minimum, we're meeting the standard. That's almost like saying we're going slower in in the wrong direction, isn't it? You know, here we're we're, we're reducing our emissions, but we're still doing harm. We're just doing it slower. And yeah. so, so I, I, I guess this is probably the, the hardest thing is what hopes, what, what thoughts do you have uh, getting us to setting the bar a little bit higher and, and offering things that uh, maybe shift the paradigm on, on where we should be in the future of business in the world as a new operating systems? You know, that paradigm shift, that setting the bar high is always uncomfortable because it's asking you to get out of your comfort zone. And I think we as gold standards already been embarked on that journey to, while talking to very open-minded corporates, NGOs, CSOs, uh, governments even, and, and really trying to see how far we can go in raising that ambition. And I think that future is coming, but right now it's all voluntary. Um, there's nothing that sort of incentivizes you to go beyond the bare minimum. So how do we create that is a big question. And, and as a small NGO standard setter, it's hard for us to just single voice, a singly um, uh, advocate for that concept. It has to be a joint effort. And we're, we're really pleased to be joining forces with quite a few respected NGOs and thought leaders in the industry where they're now seeing beyond that, what, what you exactly described, what's next, what's in the future. So we're preparing for that. We're, we're preparing a series of thought uh, pieces on how to go net positive 
and how to use market mechanisms to get there. And in order to use that market mechanism, what the market mechanism needs to look like in the next couple of years. So, so that's the journey. Um, it's it's hard. It's it's challenging. It's not. Uh, I'm not the fav the most uh, liked person in the room often, but we got to be there. So. Um, I think we're in a great position. Uh, people love gold standard. They respect and trust us and our projects. And we just need to collectively move that uh, uh, bar inch by inch higher as we go. So at some point we will be there when, when we're talking about net positive cases for corporates or cities. Um, Maggie, I wanna tell you and all my listeners that um... I've, I've really I've, I've put Maggie on the spot today and in different ways you might not have been aware of that that uh, gold standard sustained cert and, and others are very cautious about you know what they say their script there's a lot of politics and uh, political correctness and and some things because you're dealing with people from all over um, uh, uh, gold standard has wonderful communications uh, officer persons uh, uh, um, that, that we've spoken to and there's all sorts of other things, but I want you to know that, that Maggie spoke from her heart. She spoke from her knowledge and breadth of knowledge and gave us the real deal uh, of what's going on. And, and for that, I thank you. And, and my listeners will thank you that there was no creed washing or scripted anything that I've, I've thrown all, most of my tools of, of things that you you've come out very well and done done excellent and i i think i i really hope that my listeners and those who are listening to us will have a better understanding of this very complex um wonderful tools for us to really get to another place in our world and, and the last three questions i have are actually for my listeners um that i would like you to, to depart uh, one message to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that really has the power to change their life. Uh, it's your message. What would that message be? Reduce within, finance beyond. I love it. I knew you would say that. <laughs> uh, what should young innovators uh, in the field of carbon offsetting, um, uh, Carbon, maybe, yeah, just in the field of carbon offsetting, be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a true and real impact. Technology. I think, I think technology will bring scale. I think technology will bring transparency and trust, credibility, and therefore credibility in the market. So for any young innovators entering into this market, I think using the, the knowledge of technology, using the, the power of technology is critical. And I think that's that's one of the reasons why we have SustainCert as a sister company, where they're driving the technology innovation using the digital platform to scale it so that project developers benefit from it, but also the buyers benefit from it and the retailers benefit from it. So it's, it's using that technology. I think that's going to drive real transform transformative change for this sector uh, in future. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you say, boy, I wish I would have loved to know that from the beginning, from the start, my life would be different or would love to have known that from the beginning? Um, power of teamwork. And I know it's so cliche to say, but I cannot stress it more. Um, everything's delivered by people, different people from different backgrounds. So power of teamwork, uh, understanding differences and creating synergy out of those differences and common goals. I think that's something, if I had known that in my year one, two, three of my career, I would have been a better employee at the time. Um, I think that's important and, and power of leadership and people often think leadership comes from top management, but I think leadership comes from every level. And that's what makes me excited to work at Gold Standard because literally every single a colleague of mine take leadership in their work. And I think power of that and, and that goes sort of back to the, the, the notion of empowerment. like. 
the, the culture of empowerment, if that's embedded in the organization, organization thrives. And I hope uh, Gold Standard is thriving because of this culture embedded very deeply uh, uh, based on its sort of long history. So yeah, I, I wish I had known that early on, but it's not too late. <laughs> Uh, that's fabulous. That's all I have in questions. It's been absolutely wonderful. We could talk for hours. Seriously, <laughs> I, I have I have much more and we could go much deeper. Uh, uh, at least we could put many people to sleep. But I, I think it, it's been fun. I've enjoyed every minute. If there's nothing else that you would like to add this, I mean, this is your time, this last little uh, a minute or two that you if there was something you didn't get to say that's vital for us to know now is your chance otherwise i really thank you and i i just say goodbye thank you very much goodbye